I'm the Director of the Centre of Effective Therapy in Melbourne, Australia, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this series of DVDs in which we're demonstrating some ways that the solution approach can be beneficial to a variety of people in their uh, clinical dilemmas and in their life situations. As you're watching these DVDs, um, I invite you to be curious about what you may see that's already familiar, what you might notice that's just a little different from what you do, complementary to what you're uh, doing, additional to what you're already doing. And uh, in doing that, to be willing to consolidate what you've learned, to extend what you've learned, always of course with the recognition that your learning is yours and is a function of you. My background is medical. I was in a family suburban medical practice for 10 years in uh, Melbourne, in Australia. And in my medical training, I was thoroughly taught about how important it is to take a history, to gather information, to make a diagnosis, to then formulate a treatment plan which was then implemented. Um, when I met Ericsson, first of all when I heard about him and saw a film about him, I was intrigued by the different emphasis, the different starting place that his work uh, was involved with. And uh, when I met him in, and then spent some time with him in the late 70s and early 1980, just before he died, I became increasingly inspired by his general approach to dealing with psychological problems, dealing with life problems, and the way that uh, he was able to bring people's life experiences into the clinical setting. And by bringing life experiences in the clinical setting, of course, it's the client's own experiences. They're already in them, they already know about them. And so, because they belong to the client, they're really uh, so accessible to them. That, that um, direction that he worked in, that starting place that he began from, seems to me to have its origins in his uh, upbringing as a farm boy, with its very na nat natural uh, emphasis on practicality. And it seemed to fit in with my own experience. My father was very interested in woodwork, and my mother was a keen gardener, and so from an early age I learnt uh, the practicalities of working with wood and working in a garden. So when I uh, met Ericsson and spent time with him, there was something about the mood of his work that I really liked and really appreciated. And uh, it inspired me to, to bring this approach into the work that I was doing in my counselling practice, and then over the last 20 years or so to include it in my teaching of other people who are interested to learn this. What I've noticed in the solution approach is that although there are similarities with the problem-solving approach that I learned as a doctor and that is part of the mainstream uh, cl clinical approach to therapy, although there are similarities, there is there's a different emphasis. In the solution approach, instead of asking about uh, for facts about what caused what the past is, what the uh, how the problem began and details about the problem so we can then fix it. In the solution approach we're more likely to ask information about what someone likes to do, what they're doing well, what they're competent at, where their strengths are. And in the solution approach instead of trying to make a diagnosis to find out what's wrong with this person, we're more likely to explore what resource, what experience they have lost contact with, got out of touch with, uh, need to be reminded about, perhaps even need to learn, so that by exploring what this missing experience, what this missing resource is, then we, we are working with the client 
to explore their resources rather than trying to find out what's wrong with them so that we can be the agent of fixing them. In the solution approach also, we are the main uh, move, the main step, the main process that is involved is one of reconnecting someone with their natural resources, helping, helping them to find what they've lost, helping them to learn what they haven't yet learned so that they can get on with their life rather than trying to uh, fix some defect or, or correct some imbalance that was, was there as part of the problem. Now, <clears throat> because the solution approach has these important differences, important distinctions, to important different starting places, different uh, ways of different directions of moving. The, the result of this is that I've noticed in my learning and in people that have been along this journey with me that what's involved here is learning to listen differently. Instead of listening for causes in the past, we need to redirect our listening towards uh, what might be missing for this person in uh, their experience that's going to, going to take them into their future. And we can wonder about that instead of trying to understand it. And by looking for what's missing for someone, for looking, looking for what resource they may have overlooked or not yet have learnt thoroughly, uh, instead of trying to fix something that's wrong and working with someone who is by definition defective, we're working with a person in a more holistic way, uh, in, a, in a way that they, when they're talking about their likes and their resourcefulness, there is more of that person in the room, there's more of that person in the conversation, there's more of that individual available to be brought to the situation and so uh, that because there's more of them available, more of them there, they'll be more able to make the connections and move on in their life in the direction that they are wanting to. Um, there is also in the relationship, in the therapeutic relationship, uh, an interesting difference and one that I must say I prefer. When I was a doctor, I was the expert. I, was the, I had the knowledge. I had the training. I was the one that had the answers. And if someone came to see me and tried to tell me what was wrong with them, I'm, I might be inclined to say, well, don't forget that I'm the expert. In the solution approach, and Erickson demonstrated this time and time and time again, that there's more of an equality, that we're more working with someone, or even, in, even uh, at times the client then shows up not only as an equal to us, but as actually the expert in their experience, because clearly, any individual client is going to know more about their experience than we will. So in this approach we're more inclined instead of working with depression or anxiety or um, a particular diagnostic uh, category, we're much more likely to be looking primarily at who is this person? What are they like? What is it about their likes and their competencies that they like? And what, what is it about the problem that's problematic to them? By finding out about what someone likes and what's important to them, by finding out what concerns that they have that have this situation show as a problem, those few questions can give us a beautiful insight, a beautiful window into the soul of the, the individual client. We can find out more about what someone likes and what they like about that, we can find out about more about someone by asking how come this situation is a problem to them in their answers to those questions. We can find out more than a whole raft of psychological assessments in my experience. So that in the uh, demonstrations that, are part of, that these series are a part of, you'll see that, that those questions will be an important component 
looking for strengths, looking for resources, looking for what's missing, and always looking to help to reconnect that person with those missing resources. How have they handled a situation like this in the past? Has there been something like this previously that they've been able to manage, been able to deal with, been able to get past, that by reviewing that and reconnecting with that, they've, they can discover that they have some more resources than they realise and so deal with the situation. By finding out in the present time what it is about their experience that, that, that's happening when things are not so bad, when things may be even okay at times, what is this client doing differently at the times when things are working that they could do more of so that there'd be more of the solutions in contrast to a problem solving approach which is looking at what precedes the problem, what causes the problem so that we can help to prevent it. So by looking at having the resources and extending them, it very much complements the problem solving approach which is about avoiding the problem and, and dealing with it. Also, um, in this series you will hear the question frequently asked about what will it be like in the future when the problem is not there, if a miracle happened and things were okay. Uh, when we're finished in uh, conversations and you don't need to come back anymore, what's going to be different? By looking at the future, sometimes we can find some resources there that can help to draw the client towards those experiences and have those future uh, resources available in the present. It's um, an important part of this approach also to, to always reconnect what's happening in the therapeutic conversation in the therapist office with the client's life. People come to see us and it's okay if they feel okay when they're seeing us when they're in our presence. If someone comes and says, it's, a, it's nice to see you, I feel better when I'm with you, that's fine. But people don't live with us, they live in their lives. So we want to find way, ways of connecting clients with their resourcefulness in their life, in their uh, practical everyday living, not just when they are with us. So it's common to, in this approach, to ask someone, to do something, some, some kind of homework assignment, to notice when things are okay, to be aware of when things are more the way they uh, would like them to be, to, to notice what it's like to, to not have the problem around, and so on. So it's an important component to, to be you know, wanting to connect people, clients, with their uh, resourceful experiences in their life. Also, an important step is to be grateful, to thank the client. I mean, really, people come to see us and tell us, share us with, share with us some very intimate and very uh, delicate uh, concerns. And the trust that is given to us is a gift. We can't demand it. We can't require it. It's always a gift. And so, following Erickson's example, I, I like to thank people for their willingness to trust us, for their willingness to share something so important with us. And I've noticed that, that frequently by doing that, it has a beneficial effect on the client's experience. So I'm so grateful to Ericsson and uh, so, so much of what I learned from him and was inspired by him in my work and in my life. And I remember a quote um, that he said that people come to therapy not primarily to change the unchangeable past, but because of some discontent in the present and a desire for a better future. So in looking at this series of DVDs, I invite you to wonder yourself about what might be useful to you to add to your effectiveness, to extend the capacities that you already have to explore what you are already doing and things are going well in your work and so on. And also I want to be very clear how grateful I am for the people who were willing to work with me in the demonstrations in this series. Participants in training programs, people 
uh, not in programs, but almost very generously giving their permission for us to share their experience so that we can learn, so that we can have an opportunity to consolidate and extend our learning <clears throat> and take that into our future practice. So thank you for being willing to uh, be part of this and for uh, viewing this series and uh, it's a pleasure to share it with you.